Welcome to Aaron Menke's Cabinet of Curiosities, a production of iHeartRadio and Grim and Mild. Our world is full of the unexplainable. And if history is an open book, all of these amazing tales are right there on display, just waiting for us to explore. Welcome to the Cabinet of Curiosities. During times of war, those who refuse to fight often turn to activism to voice their opposition. Although every war has seen demonstrations against armed conflict, Vietnam comes to mind for many as one of the most divisive wars in modern history. And much of the opposition came as a result of the draft. The draft lottery was a system used in 1969 that conscripted young American men into fighting overseas. Protests were held across the country. Draft cards were torn up and burned and many of the fighting age fled to places like Canada to avoid having to enlist. But that wasn't the first time people were forced to fight a war against their will. It happened in World War II as well, and those facing tough choices decided to fight back in surprising and explosive ways. It all started with a plane, a B-17F bomber named the Tondaleo. The Tondaleo's 10-man crew, including pilot Bon Fox and navigator Elmer Benny Bendenier, were a ragtag group of fighters in charge of an aircraft often referred to as a flying coffin. It was a massive plane manufactured by Boeing. However, its design was inherently flawed. The B-17F was tail-heavy, made even more so once the bombs, ammunition, and the crew were all loaded on board. With its center of gravity shifted toward the back of the plane, it became slow and difficult to maneuver. Benny and the rest of the crew understood what they were getting into. The odds of surviving in a bomber during World War II were roughly 30%, but that didn't stop them from carrying out their missions as ordered and facing down German fighters in the process. But Tondaleo didn't fly all 25 missions it was meant to. It was shot down before it could be retired from service, though all of its crew did survive. But the story of this particular B-17 isn't about how capable it was, but about how lucky it was. Now, you might say that a plane that went down during battle couldn't have been that lucky. After all, it was big, heavy, and not very effective in a dogfight. But ask Benny the Navigator, and he'll tell you a much different story. It was during one particular raid when Tondaleo's crew realized just how lucky they were. They had been airborne for some time when they started taking fire from Nazi anti-aircraft guns, which were firing 20mm shells at them. One after another, the shells hit the plane. Miraculously, though, they didn't explode on impact. When Tondaleo landed, the crew examined the fuselage and were shocked at the sight. The 11 unexploded 20mm shells had been lodged into the wing gas tank. The shells were carefully extracted and sent to the armorers to be diffused. But Benny wanted to know more. Why hadn't the shells exploded when they hit the plane? Well, they had been manufactured by forced laborers. Hitler and the Nazis didn't just kill and imprison people. They often put them to work growing food, building engines, and making munitions. These workers were literally held at gunpoint, forced to help their enemies, or die. There was little they could do to rebel. But several laborers building anti-aircraft shells had figured out a unique way to fight back. When military personnel opened up the shells that had been removed from the gas tank, they didn't find any explosive materials. Almost every shell was empty, save for one. Within its hollow metal frame was a note left by the person who had assembled it. The worker had been checked and had written a message for whomever would find it. Translated, it read, This is all we can do for you, now. Eventually, though, Tondaleo's luck would run out, and its 34,000-pound hull would be claimed by the English Channel once and for all. But thanks to the rebellious spirit of several forced laborers, Benny, Fox, and the rest of the crew lived to fly another day. World War II brought out some of the best and worst in humanity. Individual acts of bravery clashed with the overwhelming death and dread of mass warfare. But in the end, the individual stories of heroism are rather remarkable. For example, it takes a special kind of bravery to charge up Normandy Beach face first into enemy gunfire. It takes a similar kind of bravery to jump out of a plane with a parachute knowing the enemy forces will be firing at you. And that kind of bravery is also found in someone who risks their own life to save hundreds of others. 
This is the kind of bravery that was found in the heart of First Sergeant Leonard A. Funk Jr. A recipient of numerous awards and honors, Funk did some incredible things during World War II, which distinguished him as one of the bravest Americans in enemy territory. But there's one particular episode that really shows us what kind of human Funk was. We already know that he was brave, selfless, and more. But this, this was something else like a series of scenes cut out of an action film that the audience immediately questions for being unrealistic. Surely, that kind of thing couldn't happen. But it did, because of Sergeant Funk. It happened on January 29th of 1945. Funk and his small company of men were stationed just outside of Holzheim, Germany, where they had spent the winter. Their goal was to take the town, but their forces were running thin. Rather than hunker down and wait for what may never come, Funk decided to continue his mission. Without enough infantrymen to keep advancing forward, Funk recruited a platoon of clerks and speed-trained them into a fighting force that he took 15 miles through artillery fire and driving snowstorms toward their objective. There, they cleared out 15 houses without losing a single unit and captured 80 German soldiers in the process. They had taken the town. But the battle wasn't over for Funk. Those 80 prisoners managed to dupe their captors and connect with a German patrol. They waited for their chance to strike and it came quickly. Funk, after doing the rounds to ensure the safety of the town, came to check on the prisoners, but rather than find reassurance, he found a German pistol poking into his stomach. With little more than a handful of soldiers nearby and the rest of his company sweeping up the town, Funk was up against the odds in a big way. The Nazis had him dead to rights, and he had nowhere left to turn. So when the Germans ordered him and his men to drop their weapons, Funk pretended to comply. He unslung his submachine gun from his shoulder, all while the cogs in his head were turning. But that's as far as Funk's compliance would go. With his machine gun still in hand and in true Allied fashion, he laughed in the Nazi faces before unloading his gun into the German officer and his company. While he fired, Funk shouted through the commotion for his men to take the Germans' weapons. Within minutes, 21 German soldiers lay dead, many more were injured, and the rest had been recaptured. And you can bet Funk was smiling as he realized what he and his men had just done. They had completely overturned the odds, recapturing a company larger than their own, and halted any hopes the Germans had of upsetting American plans in the area. And all it took was a little trickery and a whole lot of bravery. Funk returned to America after the war to receive his awards, and he has since been immortalized with his own stretch of highway in Pennsylvania. And you can bet that all the men that served with him will never forget just how brave their sergeant was that day. And his funky dose of courage. I hope you've enjoyed today's guided tour of the Cabinet of Curiosities. Subscribe for free on Apple Podcasts or learn more about the show by visiting curiositiespodcast.com. This show was created by me, Aaron Mankey, in partnership with How Stuff Works. I make another award-winning show called Lore, which is a podcast, book series, and television show. And you can learn all about it over at theworldoflore.com. And until next time, stay curious.